between my eyes What do the find? Came out better on the other side See life's like a peach if you find the same And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Atari, many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. This is part of the Prosper Show e-commerce mastery series where top sellers and experts teach you what really works to boost your e-commerce business. They have an amazing conference with some of the top Amazon sellers and industry leaders like we have today, Devin. Our sponsor today is Rise25.com, which helps service-based professionals, doctors, lawyers, accountants, coaches, create additional revenue streams and stop just trading time for dollars. Uh, They hold you accountable to achieve your biggest goals with a step-by-step roadmap. Check out Rise25.com, run by myself and co-founder John Corcoran. It's application only. Today, I'm excited. Uh, We are talking to Devin Johnson. He's founder of First Smile. They pick up hundreds of thousands of parcels all across the U.S. and internationally. Since they deliver direct direct to major shipping networks like UPS, FedEx, they can provide significant discounts. They've been named the fastest growing company in Utah, and within the first 12 months of business, they grew to a multi-million dollar company without investment or debt, and they have operations all over the U.S., United Kingdom, Italy, Hong Kong, many more. Um, They use a proprietor proprietary technology to help businesses connect manufacturing, warehousing, fulfillment, and shipping. Devin, hopefully I got that right. Thanks for joining me. Yeah, thanks for having me. You know, shipping is a very small margin business. All Most of the logistics sector is. So when you're trying to feed a family off of, you know, three cents a package, it takes thousands just to, you know, get a kid's meal at McDonald's, you know. So, yeah. So ha- having had experience in kind of the door-to-door world and business. I sold door to door all over the country. I had a little wireless company that I'd run it during the, uh, at nights. So during the daytime, when people were at their office, I would knock doors in warehouse complexes and, you know, other, you know, business units. And then about five o'clock at night, as people were going home, I'd go to the gas station, get a monster energy drink and change my shirt. And then I'd go knock doors selling dish network and internet services really? door to door so I could feed the family you know, off of the money I made at nights. And then during the day, we, I worked on my shipping business. And so, you know, it's kind of funny because even then that was like eight or nine years ago, but even today, uh, there's kind of some, some stuff that's come out of that. Namely that my full name is Devin Clyde Johnson. And, and in the early days I had to kind of like separate my worlds. So during the daytime, I would go by Clyde in, in the shipping <laughs> yeah. and at nights I was Devin. So, cause what was happening is I would be in someone's warehouse trying to set up their software and I'd get a phone call and someone would say, Hey, my internet's running slow. And, and I, that was a lower priority. So when, if they, if I answered the phone and they said, is Devin there, I would take a message and call him later. Likewise, if it was, you know, 10 o'clock at night and I was working on someone's internet speed and someone said, is Clyde there? I knew that something was going on and I needed to take the that's, calls. That's more pressing. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's so funny because I'll be on a, even today. I'll be on a conference call, you know, uh, from someone he, you know, who the was early involved. customer. Yeah, and I, you know, how you call and you say, "Hey, Devin's here," you know, you know, we'll all check in, and then and, and someone inevitably will say, "Well, is Clyde getting on the call?" You know, so it's 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 kind of an inside joke for people that know us, you know. That goes back nine years. So you started the company nine years ago. Well, I got into the this industry about nine years ago. This company, First Mile, started in, in the spring, uh, April 2012. Okay. So it's a totally new business, but I kind of, I started selling shipping products door to door about nine years ago. Yeah. So what were the shipping products? Uh, nine back, years ago. Yeah. Is, yeah. It was a very very niche USPS product that was kind of, you know, there's kind of a frenzy over like these NSAs that that are just pretty much a commodity now. But uh, back then it was kind of this new thing. And so uh, my whole life was um, just understanding technology and figuring out why all these people had a shipping software called Dazzle. You know, I, I, it took me a while to figure out if it was Be Dazzled or Dazzle or, you know, what it was. But anyways, I, I definitely earned my stripes back then, you know. I want to go back, you know, to your mission days at some point. But 
But what works going door to door? Obviously, you are a seasoned, toughened, hardened door to door person because you've been doing it for years. What do you find? What tactics and things work well when you're actually uh, approaching that? You know what? You, what it really comes down to is being a workhorse, not a show horse. I mean, you can spend a lot of time reading, you know, we, we read a lot of sales books and there's definitely some sales tactics that work and, you know, things like that. But by far, more than anything, being mm -hmm. a short horse uh, is is not as important as being a workhorse, because you know when you, you you learn the jargon and you learn who to talk to and how to talk to them, you know you, you just you learn that stuff over time. So just literally just knowing how to roll up your sleeves yeah. and just be consistently, you know, hunting. That's that's what it takes, really, to be yeah. honest. I mean, you know, when you when you approach a door someone's immediate reaction is to not want to open the door for a solicitor or someone. So sure. do you have like a greeting that you find people open up to or like, what would you say to people in when you were nine years ago when you're going up to their door? Oh yeah, sure. I mean, absolutely. There's definitely some tactics in doing that, but you know, to be honest, it's just total transparency and a smile, you know, and, and, there's definitely a vibe that, that people carry when they're kind of going door to door. And that, I think that kind of can put people in a defensive posture. So figuring out how to, how to, how to just step in the door in a way that doesn't put something in a defensive posture. Right. So that could totally vary based on the industry that you're in. Yeah. You know, for me, probably one of the best things was, you know, I, I'm, I'm a shipping guy, right? So I didn't, I didn't want to talk to your accountant. I didn't need to talk to your HR person. Um, I didn't necessarily need to talk to your CEO. I, I, so if I knew I was going to be in an area where there was maybe a, a customer that I really had my eye on or that I knew I was going to be approaching, or if I knew an area I was going that day, I could look at the companies I was going to, I'd, I would get on LinkedIn or Facebook, or I'd just Google your website mm. and I'd see if I could just find the name of a guy in shipping. Right. So right. when I walk in, I had a friendly face and I asked for someone by name. Yeah. Um, so that it didn't feel like I was in there just like looking for somebody to listen yeah. to me. I, I right. came up with the purpose of someone to talk to. And so that's that helped. smart. Doing some research ahead of time. Instead of like, hey, can I talk to your shipping manager is a lot less personal. Like, hey, like is Tom here from shipping? Yeah, exactly. Yes. Because if I say, hey, is someone here from shipping? The first thing that is, is do you have an appointment? Who are right? you? Yeah, get, say, get out. Here? It's like, are you a buddy of his? Yeah, sure. Let me grab him. You know? <laughs> I will be after five minutes. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, so there's all sorts of little quirky things that I learned, you know, because I did door to door. If you had my mission days yeah. to traditional door to door, you know, I did it for almost 10 years. So, you know, I've knocked thousands, hundreds of thousands of doors probably all throughout America. So, you know, if you want to get yourself into some interesting situations, you just start, you just stop into a random neighborhood. Some random city, and you just start knocking on doors, and you'll you'll get you'll get some uh, pretty fun experiences. So, Devin, what's your craziest door-to-door -door story? Even if it's part of your mission days. Oh my gosh, I don't even know if I can <laughs> talk. About it. You know, you might have to censor this. <laughs> but uh, uh, you know, I've been I was chased off of a door one time with a guy who, a, a guy who was I guess I'll say large in stature. He was uh, very healthy, big guy. And uh, he chased me off the door with a shotgun one time. Really? Why? Just, just he, he didn't want someone on his door. And he was just having a bad day, I guess. Uh, and uh, you know, so a lot of a lot of a lot of people answer their. You'd be shocked how many people answer their door nude. Really? You know, they just pull nude. up, open just the door. Don't care. Yeah, just you know, any any inhibitions they have have been lost on them years ago. Uh, but. Uh, but yeah, lots of crazy stuff like that happens. So Devin, how do you get over the mental block or mental mentally if you like maybe you go a stretch of like 50 doors and they're just kind of slamming in your face over and over? What do you do mentally to kind of recruit? change your paradigm. You got to get to a place where you're comfortable being uncomfortable. Yeah. And you've got to really understand is very much like in business. You know, I, you, it's like a roller coaster. You 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 you're going to ride the highs and you're going to ride lows, but you yeah. have to figure out how to do is to steady your emotions. And it's a very physical, it's, it's very much a decision to not let yourself, um, get too high on the highs or get too low on the lows. You have to make yeah. a conscious decision to say, Hey, 
I just had a win, but I know I got to get right back to work because I got to, I got to produce for the next one. And also when you go for three days, not, not, not 50 doors, three or four days and not having your results, you know, hundreds of doors a day for three or four days at a time with no results can potentially be a little bit demoralizing for sure. You've got to get yourself to a place where you know you can win and you just got to keep fighting to get that next win. So it's very much um, less tactic and more conscious decision to, to not get too high on the wins and not too low on yeah. the losses. Is there something you tell yourself at that point? Like after three days, like I know it, it took me last time 1,026 doors to knock on. Or what do you tell yourself mentally? Because that makes perfect sense. But when you're in the moment, it's tough. Like if you're in that low moment, it's tough to think yeah. You know, think not emotionally about it. I'm wondering you know, if there's I, any things you. I actually don't know any like specific tactic no. other than making sure you have you know an incentive, whether that be money or you know for me, it's feeding kids. You know, I mean, right. I especially when when I started this business, I was very uncomfortable with what I was doing and the and the trust that I had and in, in in you know kind of the situation I was in, and I just knew I needed to. I had, I had quit college, so I couldn't just go put my resume in somewhere. So if I was going to feed my family, I had to do it hunting. So I just yeah. had to always be hunting. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I just um, – It's just I, do or die. Well, I think it goes back to, to being more of a workhorse than a show horse. Like there, there might be some special fancy things you can do to tell yourself or some quotes you can write down. But I think more than anything – just having some grit and, and bearing down and knowing yeah. that if you put in the time, you'll get the wins. When you have the win, you can't get too excited yeah. about it because you know you got to get right back to grinding again. So yeah. just really getting to where you can, you're comfortable being uncomfortable. Now all of a sudden, no's are normal. You know, wins are good, but you don't really experience these yeah. these downtimes per se. Yeah, but I feel like in your head, it was in your head like, okay. Um, either I do this or, you know, I feed my kids and that, yeah, that's, yeah. That, that was in your head, you know, probably the yep. whole time is you had that something, it's like a pain motivator. Like if I don't do this, the kids aren't eating type of thing. It's, it's very much a stick and a carrot, right? I mean, you, you've, you've got the, I knew that what we were, especially once we started building first mile, you know, I knew we, I knew that what we were doing was not intuitive to the industry, meaning there was a lot of pushback in the way we wanted to build our model. It was it was really thought down upon, I guess you would say, being an asset-based provider. Everyone was about being a brokerage or being a non-asset-based provider. Mm -hmm. So what we were doing was, I think, kind of counterintuitive to what, I guess, the industry would have otherwise told mm -hmm. us. So it was fairly risky, but I knew that I knew that we could do something special if we executed. So that was kind of the carrot for me. But then the stick was, you know, you have to produce or you right. literally can't pay your rent next month. So, yeah. Um, yeah. you know. So at what point did you hire your first kind of developer person for the technology side? Because, I mean, um, in the beginning it was you selling, delivering, yeah. everything. And obviously you weren't coding from like 3 a.m. to 5 a.m. and then no, not no, sleeping. Not so. at all. But one of the first yeah. things we saw was this huge need um, – for development and I mean this calls I, I don't want to bore you with the details of why but suffice it to say that we we needed this piece of technology and so I found someone that I could I could never have afforded like from a seller perspective so I would I would hire on contract in tranches and he worked on contract for us for about two years and then well about a year and a half and for a, probably 80 percent of that time I was trying to talk him into coming to work with us but right. he had a great you know, daytime job, very secure, big, stable company, you know, and here's this kid in this little office, you know, trying to get him over. And it's just like, no way he had a new, you know, he had a new wife. And so we were too risky. Uh, so we just kept on contract. And then eventually, you know, we finally talked him into coming over full time. Mm. And um, since then, we've, we've built out that technology. We've also outsourced two huge pieces of technology that 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 we own but we've built through contract labor so uh we have a mix of both of in-house you know, and contracted code that we've had to develop yeah and then tell me about the expansion what did the expansion look like so obviously it's you and then you're probably serving the local area because now you're in united kingdom italy hong kong you're all over the place yeah where did well, that where did you first expand and how did it go from there 
so we have different functions in those areas. So the the core first model functions, uh, you know, we we ship to I don't know two hundred something countries. So um, we also have customers in those countries. We also have uh, you know physical brick and mortar facilities, um, like in Italy, for example. And then we have a technology base in Hong Kong. Um, and so we've we've always just grown to the customer, meaning. We've created new products when we felt a pain point or a demand for it. And we've tried to build in a way that we knew could scale and have application for our other customers. Yeah. And so we've just always had to do it in a way that we could pay for it and then hope we could sell it and monetize it, you know, after the fact to our customer base. So what are some of the products? I know you have an annual sales conference coming up. So what are you going to talk about at the annual sales conference? Well, uh, lots of things. Everything from SOPs for implement implementation and setting up customers to you know how to you know provide the, the proper tariffs to clients so that you know we're not we're not starting off in the hole you know running a big twenty six foot straight truck to a customer that gives us one bag of you know two ounce cell phone covers every day. So you know understanding how to run those SOPs. But from a product perspective, most of our training will be based around a new product called XParcel, which is um, very, uh, I guess, new. I guess I would say to the industry, and that's that's our that's the ship method, the first mile ship method. So XParcel. That, yep, that tells us, hey, this cost. We have XParcel expedited, XParcel ground, XParcel same day. Um, that basically what that tells us is, hey, this customer wants to ship expedited, or in other words, this customer needs it delivered in three to five days. XParcel is a ship method that runs this logic on the back end that says, hey, here's you, you're getting it from zip code A to zip code B. Here's you know four or five of our partners that can do that. Here's the one that's the least cost option and sends back the appropriate label, tracking number, cost of the shipment, hmm. wraps up that data, sends, sends the manifest off to the appropriate induction point, yeah. and yeah. then uh, gets it routed onto the truck and into the right induction point and gets the package delivered. And so there's a lot of moving parts there. What faces the customer is hopefully very simple and clean, but what it takes to <laughs> all the a lot of mice running in the background. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of stuff there, right? And so, uh, training our people on how to appropriately, you know, not, not only support it but sell it and and, and nurture it and develop it is uh, uh, it, it it's a very sensitive thing. So we'll be doing a lot of training on that. We just rolled out um, same day delivery. Um, we launched. We've been building the technology to do it for about two years. We wow. started a beta test about six months ago. That's gone really well. Uh, we did a beta test with one client, rolled that up to about four or five. Now I think we have a dozen or so um, out of hundreds, and so we'll slowly mm-hmm. start turning those dials on. And uh, we're doing we're doing deliveries now in Salt Lake yeah. City. We're procuring the vehicles. Uh, we have a fleet of Priuses, so mm-hmm. we're. We'll be putting a new fleet inside in Southern California, where actually our largest customer base is, um, and then we'll be rolling out to Phoenix, Denver. We have a facility where uh, we have trucks running in New York City with a new facility coming in, and, and also new deliveries coming there uh, probably by the end of this year. Mm-hmm. So um, that's kind of what we'll be doing a lot of training. Interesting. On. So Devin, are companies like Amazon and Walmart would they look at acquiring a company like you because of the capabilities you have of getting things out in a certain radius? You know, I think that, or is that not in their, no, their realm I, I of thinking? Th- I think that very much it it potentially can be. You know, um, we don't really. I guess we don't spend a lot of time like looking for that per se, but um, but the functions or the mechanics of what we do have an incredible amount of application for those sorts of companies, um, just in terms of what our capabilities are. Um, but uh, you know, I don't know we. What we know is that uh, there there are a lot of needs not being met in the e-commerce logistics space, right. but it's a huge space and it changes very fast and the technology is can be overwhelming. So um, we're consumed with trying to understand what do we need to do well two right. and three years yeah. from now yeah. because we need to start building now in order to have yeah. it perfected two years from now. What do you do? Because I mean, like there's day to day where you're servicing the customers in the current technology. Do you and your team kind of go away like into the foothills of your mountain home uh, every three months to, to write on a whiteboard to figure out where to go in two to three years? Or how do you plan yeah, wish, for that? I wish it was that organized. <laughs> uh, um, 
you know, a lot of it's guess and check, to be honest. Um, but keeping a pulse on the industry and understanding yeah. what's going on, and hopefully our intuition is right. You know, I we've 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 made some bad bets, yeah. but most of them have been right on. Um, and so, you know, I think that I think that we're on the right track. What's we something just, like that, Devin? That right now you made a right bet. Um, it wasn't so obvious when you first made it, but not but. It, it's obvious now that that was the right bet. Oh, uh, for us, probably by far the biggest one is building our own technology and buying, running the trucks for pickups because that, you know, especially five years ago, um, you know, because other companies outsource that they'll have the technology, but they'll have other trucks pick it up. Just like traditional trucking companies. I mean, you have the actual guys that run the trucks. But maybe as big of an industry are the guys that sell space on those trucks, right? And so, you know, those brokerages are can be incredible profit centers and and you know, they're they're incredible businesses. Um that's just not what we are. That's just not what I was wanting to become. Um and so we didn't want to just particularly connect the dots per se. We wanted to actually contribute to the supply chain. I was seeing what companies like Shipworks and Ready Shipper and 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 ShipStation were contributing to the e-commerce environment, but nobody was making a, a a dent of difference in the actual logistics. Like, you know, orders came in from ten different places into one application. They were going out with four or five different carriers, but that was the end of the innovation, right? And so um, I just felt like there was an incredible amount of innovation there. Yeah. Uh, but it required technology and it required mm. trucking assets. There's a and, barrier to entry there. I mean, oh, huge. yeah, yeah, huge. Yeah. Um, and so I think owning our own trucks, it, it would probably still be debated today. In fact, we still have debates about it. But um, me personally, it's probably one of the maybe the riskiest, but the best differentiation was, was um, saying it's it's incredibly limiting because of the capex and, and, and scaling. Um but, but, you know, we have customers in over 40 states. And so experiencing a relationship with First Mile does not require a truck per se, um, but it does require us to get your packages picked up every day. So sometimes we still have to contract it and outsource it. But at our core and in our core, um, I guess, uh, territories, um, yeah. you do have a, 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 a uniformed First Mile driver and a, and a branded First Mile truck show up every day. And in some cases now you have a branded First Mile uh, truck and driver delivering your packages every day also. Yeah, that's cool. What other software and tools do you see e-commerce uh, companies using? Obviously, you know, there's the besides the first mile suite, what else? Just in general, you mean that, only pertaining to logistics? Uh, no, in general, that you think is important that you see, because um, you have your finger on the pulse probably of of all the things people are using in their business. Yeah, I wouldn't say all, but I mean, we definitely see a lot, you know, everything from applications like Channel Advisor or things that compute with Channel Advisor, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a really big feat to, you know, manage your listings and to get them uploaded and to, you know, keep the same images in this marketplace as in this one and this one and this one and this one and, and keeping the pricing, you know, similar and the description similar, you know, that's a, that's a full-time job just managing that in one channel, let alone 10, um, so, you know, we see a lot of innovation and a lot of companies leveraging the use of those sorts of technologies. What we deal with the most is on the WMS side of things, you know, uh, warehouse management, transportation management systems, you know, are, are big. We work with a lot of those types of companies. So that's what we interact with the most because we're on the back end of e-commerce right, versus right. The front selling side. But, um, that's, I mean, that's like an established player. Any up and coming players that you, people should look out for? in the software e-commerce space? Yeah. Um, you know, not, not off the top of my head that no. people no. wouldn't really be aware of. Um, but, uh, you know, there are, there are a lot of really good things. I think you just got to keep your eyes open and, and, and be willing to try new things or at least look into new things. You don't want to go and invest, you know, days at a time into 10 different things. And now you've wasted 30, you know, a month of your life. Yeah. Um, but you know, I, I don't think you can be closed off. And to be honest, you know, that's that's where we've created a lot of opportunity is, you know, you think, you know, man, logistics has been around for ever. I mean, it's probably one of the world's oldest industries. How do you make a change in that? Um, but sometimes those create huge opportunities where it's kind of ripe for innovation. 
And as a company, we've had a huge advantage in that we've been very nimble and we could change and move very quickly. But it's also kind of a, it's, it's a challenge as we've grown to stay as nimble. And that's probably my biggest fear in terms of our go forward competitiveness is keeping our sales teams as hungry and as nimble and being able mm-hmm. to perform for the customers as quickly as we historically have. And at the same time, build in a way that's organized and that doesn't create chaos for the back end teams who have to manage it all. And so um, for me, that's a big fear is making sure we don't get so big that we become as slow as everybody else. Um, and so I'm, I hope we're still doing that well and I hope we will continue to do that well. But I think that applies in these other cases with other companies in that you've got to stay hungry for innovation. And a part of that is understanding what other options are out there to do things better. Yeah. If you just yeah. think that what works today will work forever, um, you will die. You know, yeah. you've, you've got to be able to evolve or you won't exist for very long. So, you know, Devin, obviously in the early days, you were hungry because you feed your kids, right? Yes. So how do you how do you keep your sales team hungry? Uh, money. <laughs> <laughs> they have kids to feed also. Uh, you know, that's that's a little tongue in cheek. Obviously, that's a component to yeah. anyone's living. Um but, but I think what we're doing is very exciting, and I think that um, once people understand what we're doing, they, they appreciate that, man, this could really be something unique and special. So I think having our people invested in and bought in on what we're doing and, and the uniqueness of it is, is important. Um, and I think, I think that they're excited to be building something unique and exciting. Um, and, I, and I hope that 10 years from now will be the same, the same way. I mean, if we had done things our second year in business, the way we had the first year, we would have died the second year. Yeah. And if we had done things the third year, the way we did in the second year, we would have died. Yeah. So we've had to evolve every year and pivot and change every year. And I would estimate that's going to, that's going to be the same, the same every year going forward. Um, and so hopefully what that creates is excitement and change and keeps people hungry to keep growing and building. How do you find a good salesperson? Um, because I'm sure you're all you're always growing, you're always expanding, you're always probably looking for good yep. sales. I feel like everyone I talk to any company, they're always looking for yeah. a good salesperson. So sales I'm curious is, of your process. Sales is kind of that's your engine, right? I mean, not only to grow, but it also seems to be a cure cure all for a lot of problems that yeah. plague businesses. And so it is. It's very challenging. Yeah. Um, I mean, do you get like a headhunter? Do you like search certain play? I mean, what do a you? A lot of companies have we haven't. Um, we, we kind of have a, have a hybrid sales model. We've, we've been fortunate to work with a lot of sales partners in the early days where, you know, I couldn't afford payroll for years. I mean, I, I couldn't, especially good salespeople. So for us, we worked with a lot of like contract salespeople or, or people that had kind of been in our industry or, or a similar industry that, that touched our customer base, but maybe didn't offer our products. And so we worked mm. with them on a contract basis for a lot. Once we, once we got a little bit bigger, we started hiring in-house salespeople. And we have some really fantastic in-house salespeople now, and so uh, a lot of it's been luck. We've we've had the, some that haven't worked out, and we've had some that have been fantastic. And so, um, and it's it's interesting. I'm trying to figure out the answer to that question myself because we've had some some people come in. You think you're going to hit a home run, and they just right. can't seem to. What is it? Yeah. Any guys come in that you just think aren't going to last a month, and they just hit a home run, and so I don't know. <laughs> You know, but I, I. What's that magic sauce? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. When you find the answer, let me know. Man. I'll let you know. <laughs> yeah. So, Devin, this has been hugely valuable. So I want to thank you so much. And I have one last question. Um, everyone, first of all, should check out FirstMile.com. That's a great domain, by the way. Thank you. Did you have to acquire that from someone, yes. or you did? Yeah, we had to sit on it for a while because we couldn't afford it, and, and I couldn't stomach paying for it, and we we negotiated on it for a, a long time because our, our actual our company name is International Fulfillment Solutions and we went, we go by the uh, acronym IFS a lot. Yeah. Uh, that didn't really, you know, when I was out selling customers and they were, they were trying to, it's hard enough to understand all this stuff going on and, you know, so I would kind of try and explain, look, the post office is a last mile delivery partner and we have partners that can route packages around the country and get it to the last mile. We're the exact opposite of the post office. We're the first mile. Mm-hmm. And you so just kept saying where, it. That's where the name came from. Yeah. yeah. And it stuck. And, yep. 
So last yes. question, Devin, because I know you're a busy man. You probably have to, I know you have to get on a flight tomorrow. You probably have to call Hong Kong. I don't know. But um, last question is, what's been, um, would you say, the lowest moment? And what would, be, what would you say has been one of the proudest moments in the business? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, Beside being chased off of the porch with a shotgun, that does not count yeah. for the lowest. Um, I would say... Probably by far the highest point is actually less less having to do with, you know, I would say the wins we've had with customers per se, but, you know, um, and it's kind of a double-edged sword. When we were first growing, I knew every employee, I knew, you know, usually their spouses and their kids and, you know, some unique thing about their situation. Um, and oftentimes now I'll be in the kitchen or the break room or somewhere and someone will walk in wearing a first mile uniform or, you know, they're sitting in a cubicle and I'm not sure who they are or where they came from. Um, but to be able to realize that there's some family behind that person that's having, you know, they're being able to produce for themselves and have an environment that they are comfortable working in. That, that's probably the most fulfilling for Providing me. for the staff um, and the families of the staff. Yeah. Knowing that we've created something that, that is self-sustaining in the, in the sense that, you know, people that can can come and work hard and do a good job can provide for themselves and their families and have a way to to increase in their livelihood and their their satisfaction and happiness level um, that's very satis that, that's very satisfying for me so I would say that's probably the the high is when you have a situation like that mm -hmm. um, the low is you know the stress probably on you know family you know and and uh, you know it's challenging because of this you have three kids and one on the way yeah, 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 and, and that's exciting. Yeah, it is. It's just you know the business. There's no turn off or you don't. It doesn't turn on at eight and turn off at six. You know, so it's just kind of constantly there. So that can be wearing on your family when you just sometimes it's not. It's not one of those things where you know I see a lot of these like quotes or something you know online or LinkedIn like oh you gotta put more you, you gotta like you know spend more time or split your time or you know be a little bit more diversified in your things and. It's like, man, that just sounds great, but yeah. a lot of times there's just things that you just you have to do or you die. Like you just you don't have a choice. Well, your choice is do it or die. And so, um, yeah, I could be worrying. Maybe on, that's the quote you put on LinkedIn: "Do it or die." Do it or die. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you know. Um, and so, yeah, you, you don't you you don't have the luxury of just like not responding to that thing or yeah. dealing with that issue or you know addressing that concern. And so. Um, For sure. No, that can be that can be challenging sometimes. Yeah, for sure. Devin, thank you so much. This has been awesome. Uh, everyone should check out firstmile.com. And then you guys will be at the Prosper Show uh, as well, right? Yeah, yeah. Come yeah. say hi. Uh, I'm sure we'll have great mints like everybody else. <laughs> Find some unique swag this year. That's that's one of the biggest challenges, is, you know, getting swag that doesn't go in the garbage before it gets <laughs> convention floor. Don't guess. We'll have to brainstorm that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you again, Devin. Thanks, Absolute Jeremy. pleasure. Appreciate it. Have a good one. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand.